Oh my goodness. I've been waiting a long time to say this. It's good to see you. How are you doing, church family? <laughs> oh my goodness, today, today is a special day because whether you're with us in person, whether you're joining us online, together we are in the presence of God. Psalm 16 says that in the presence of God there is fullness of joy. There are pleasures forevermore. So let's unite together. Let's lift our voice. Let's worship God in wonder and in awe of His goodness and His love. Are you ready to do that together today? All right, let's get started.
Hi, my name is Emily, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from Psalm 86. And we chose this scripture specifically because it so truly reflects our prayer to our Father as we are in this season. So the verses are going to be up on the screen, and you can follow along with me. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servant and save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me, and you, Lord, have comforted me. Would you pray together with me? Compassionate and gracious Lord, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, May the words of that poem find their place deep within us. May the posture of that scripture, Lord, mold us and teach us into becoming more and more into the people that you want. People of love, people of unity, people of grace and kindness, of joy, people of the kingdom of heaven. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. I ask that right now you would fill our hearts, fill our worship, speak to us. Speak to us this morning, Holy Spirit.
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, may in the space between all the things I'm seeing and this reckoning.
Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, you are holy. And because of that, we're here on holy ground and we're reminded that you are the same loving, powerful God yesterday and today and forever, God. You are a rescuing God when we are stuck. You are a saving God when we are ruined. You are a father who has not abandoned his children. And today we're together and we're reminded that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're looking at, no matter what the circumstances of our world, you are our unchanging God. And you have not forgotten us. And you have rescued us. And you have saved us. And you are with us in this room as we watch from wherever we are today. Your presence is here. And so we we stand on holy ground and we thank you for that and we thank you for your son who made that possible fill us with hope this morning we pray these things in Jesus name amen how many of you are glad to be together again in Jesus name come on let's praise him Wow man you guys sounded great have a seat my name's Lee, and I have been longing for today to see your faces. It was hard not to just be in tears over there. It's been a crazy year, hasn't it? And we are so thrilled in all of our locations to be gathering together, but we're also thrilled for those of you who are still watching with us online. You're a part of this. You're gathered with us. Jesus said whenever we gather together in his name, he's there. He's with us. And we believe that in this room, and we believe that for wherever you are. I get the privilege of welcoming anybody today that may be watching or here in the room that's new. Maybe you haven't been around here very long. We just want to do something for you. Take out your phone and just text the word NEW to 23101. That's the number, 23101. Text NEW. We want to send you a Starbucks gift card. Just buy you a cup of coffee to say, hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here. And you know, maybe you did that already. Maybe, maybe you've been here for a little while, but you've never really taken the next step to get plugged into the life of the church or even the next step in your journey with Jesus. We're a church that believes in next steps. And we do something around here called Next Move. We call it that because we believe it's everyone's next move. And if you haven't participated in that, would you do me a favor, just that same number, 23101, and just text the word next. Our Next Steps team wants to connect with you, tell you a little bit about Next Move, or answer any questions that you may have. Here's the thing about our Next Move gatherings. Uh, I'm a part of those gatherings, a lot of our staff is, and even Pastor Witt is a part of those gatherings. He wants to connect with you, he wants to get to know you a little bit better. And it's not just about taking a step with our church. It's really about taking a next step in the journey and the adventure of walking with Jesus. And so I hope that you'll take advantage of that and do that. Hey, one thing we want to mention today is an event that's coming up July 29th, 30th, and 31st. It's our Uncommon Youth event. This is for junior hires and high schoolers. I've mentioned this before, but for my family, I've got two teenage boys. Last year, the Uncommon event was probably the most significant spiritual event of their lives last year. And so I would highly encourage you, if, you've, if you're in the room and you're a teenager, if you've got kids that are teenagers, even grandkids, get them registered for this event. We've changed things a little bit this year because of COVID. It, there's not an overnighter involved like there was last year. It's just gonna be Wednesday night, during the day Thursday and during the day Friday. And we've also had to limit the number of, of students that we can take to 400. We've already had over half of that register. We got about 175 spots left. So this Wednesday is the deadline for the early bird registration. You can save a little money if you get registered early. So you wanna check that out and get registered for that event. Every service we take a time to give. God has been generous to us, and so we follow his example to be generous. We've got a couple different ways that we're doing that this morning. What we're not gonna do today is pass the buckets. 
Uh, we're not gonna have those passed down, everybody touch in the same bucket. We're gonna do it a little different. So here are the two ways that we're gonna do it. You can still take your phone out, text the word GIVE, and a dollar amount to 23101, and it'll give you instructions there on, on how you can give digitally. Or if you came prepared to give a physical offering today, we've got drop boxes at all of the exits. When the service is over, you can just drop your offering in that secure drop box, and you can give that way. Would you bow your heads with me, and we'll pray over this time of giving. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus as an act of generosity, a gift to us. You led the way in giving, and we just follow your lead. And I just pray that as we give our resources, as we give our gifts, you might multiply those for your purposes. I'm so thankful for this church family who have given so faithfully for so many years, including this year, that we are able to make a difference in the Tulsa area and around the world in your name, Jesus. And now I pray that you'd give us wisdom to continue to do that with the resources that you've supplied to us. Thank you for the gifts that are given. Thank you for those who give. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. There's no shortage of division in our world. These issues are both complex and deeply personal. We'd all say we want good in the world, justice and peace in our homes, our community, our country. We want unity, right? But who gets to define what that looks like? And as Christ followers, what does that require of us? What does it actually mean to be one? <laughs> hey church, how you doing? So, so good to see you guys in this room and so good to be gathered with everybody online. Man, it's just, it's awesome to be here this weekend. Awesome to have you here this weekend. I've been preaching in here for a while. It's just you haven't been showing up. Where have you been? Anyway, so, 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 so good to see you. Hey, before we jump in today, I want to just let you know, and this is specifically for those of you who are gathered with us here in this room, is you're going to notice a little bit different setup. We've got camera guy up here on the stage, camera guy down here. We didn't used to do that. The reason that we're doing that is, and this is really cool, there are more people joining us online than there are physically present in this room. And that's kind of a new reality for us. Honestly, it's a reality that we hope never changes because we want to keep reaching more and more and more people. And so I got these cameras up here so that I can kind of turn. In fact, go ahead and turn this camera on, guys. So I can turn and talk to this camera and be kind of close to people in, in their living room or wherever they happen to be joining from. And so occasionally in this message, I'm going to turn and talk to this camera. And I'm not trying to ignore you, but I'm just looking people in the eye, right, who are in their living room or kitchen or on vacation or wherever they might be gathering uh, and listening or watching this weekend. And so anyway, I just wanted to kind of explain that to you so it doesn't feel weird whenever I turn and, and start talking to, uh, to some of these other cameras. So anyway, so good to see you guys. And can we just welcome everybody who's joining us from all over the place? Because there's a lot of people all over right now. Put our hands together and say, hey, so glad to have you this weekend. We haven't gathered in 16 weeks. It's been 16 weeks, we, we haven't been together. And I think about kind of what was going on 16 weeks ago. Do you remember 16 weeks ago, what it felt like, the week that kind of everything sort of just went crazy? It was a, an interesting season. And I think about the feelings that I felt at that time. Probably the feelings that you felt, fear, uncertainty, what's gonna happen? What's gonna to happen to my family? What's gonna to happen to my business? Am I gonna still have a, a job? How dangerous is this? How, how threatening is this to my family? And that was kind of the general mood and feeling that I felt just around me in the city and around the country And when I looked on the news and everything. It was just a, a general feeling of fear and uncertainty. But as we've kind of moved through these 16 weeks, the temperature has kind of changed a little bit. It's moved from being kind of about fear and uncertainty to division and outrage. I think we've moved from our uncertainty and we've kind of settled into our opinions, right? Our perspectives of exactly what's going on, how this is working or how it ought to work. 
And so we're coming with our opinions, and I, I'm just seeing a lot of division right now, and it's crazy. I'm seeing division over just about everything. I mean, pretty much every day, you can wake up and look at your news feed and see somebody, a video of somebody flipping out somewhere, whether that's in a Costco or a restaurant or a bus stop or a convenience store or whatever, like losing their mind over what seems to me to be a pretty small thing or a small issue. People kind of just sort of freaking out. There's division everywhere, division about the virus, division about how we're handling the virus, division about politics, division about masks, should I, shouldn't I wear them, is it a violation of my personal freedom or whatever, I mean, division about race, division about uh, views toward the police, all kind, just divided, 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 and, and disagreement isn't new. We've always had disagreement, that's not new. What I'm seeing today that is new is I feel like people are drawing more proverbial lines in the sand than ever before. Like if you cross this line, I, I, I'm not sure we can be connected anymore. I'm not sure I can do business with you anymore. I'm not sure I'm gonna go to your church anymore. And I'm seeing this division kind of creep its way into the body of Christ. And it breaks my heart because if anybody ought to be united in this season, it ought to be the church. We ought to be leading the way in this regard, but I feel like that our enemy is working. And, and here's what I've seen, and we'll talk more about this as we dig into this series, but distance, I think, creates opportunity for division. Distance creates opportunity for suspicion, for questions, for questioning. And listen, it's okay to have questions. It's okay to go, hmm, wonder why they did that or wonder why that was chosen to do, do things that way. But there's this sort of suspicion that I'm seeing, and I'm not just talking to you, Church on the Move, I'm talking to the capital C Church, because as I talk to pastors, heck, as I talk to business leaders and friends of mine who are in the business community, and the way that they're talking about like what's happening with their clients, people are just on edge. The feeling that I have right now is this sense like we're a pot of water. You know when you're, you're, you're getting water ready to boil and you've got it on the burner and it's, it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and right before it boils you can see all those little air bubbles you know, starting to collect at the bottom of the pot and it starts to kind of bubble up to the top just before it starts to boil. That's kind of the sense that I have of what it, it is going on right now, what it just feels like around the city, around the country, What's happening right now is just this division, 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 division. And what we're gonna see as we dig into this series is that the church ought to be about unity. I wanna, I wanna share with you, in fact, as we kinda open this up together today, I wanna share with you an amazing prayer. In fact, a, a, an excerpt from a prayer that Jesus prayed. And this is a significant prayer because Jesus is looking forward in history, in time, from his day, and he's actually praying for you. John 17 is the only place where we get this prayer. It's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And he prays specifically for you and for me. And I want us to notice specifically what he prays. Let's look at John 17 for a second. Jesus is praying and he says, my prayer is not only for them alone, so he's not just praying for his disciples, right? the people in his time and in his day and in his place, but look at this. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now who is that? Well that's you and that's me, that's us, Church on the Move. This is who we are. Jesus is looking forward through history and he's praying for you. And what does he pray on our behalf? What does he, he could ask for anything. We know that his prayer will be perfect it will be exactly what should have been prayed. There'll be no deviation, no rabbit trail. It will be an exactly perfect prayer. What does Jesus pray? He says, I pray that all of them may be one. You're gonna see that word a lot today as we dig through the scripture, one. Look at this, as Father, you and I are, are one, as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, and here's the reason. This is what Jesus is after, so that the world, everybody else, we're the, the battleground, right, that's going on all around us, people taking sides and taking shots at one another, 
All of that so that people, when they look at us, when they look at the church, they will believe that you have sent me. I want to turn your attention now to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at some verses from the Apostle Paul, and then we'll jump into kind of where we're going this weekend. Paul writes this. He says, make every effort. This is written to a church much like ours. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then here we go. Let's count how many times we read the word one in here. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Seven times the Apostle Paul says the word one here in these few verses. And if you know anything about numbers in Scripture, then what you know is that the number seven in Scripture represents completion. Nothing lacking. So what Paul here is saying is, look, in every way, in every way that I can possibly explain it and say it to you, you are to be one. In fact, he opens up by saying, make every effort to keep the, the bond of unity, right? The, or the spirit of unity through the bond of peace. How do we do that? Well, we're gonna take the next five weeks and we're gonna dig into this idea of unity. This is a rich subject. And I really feel impressed by the Holy Spirit to talk about this right now because I think this is absolutely appropriate for our current cultural moment. And so for the next five weeks, we're gonna dig into this subject of unity. Today, what I wanna do is give you three thoughts about unity. We're just gonna kinda of dive in or jump into the shallow end of the pool as we kind of explore this really rich and fascinating idea and subject of unity. So let's jump in. Number one, the first thing I want to share with you today is this, the power of unity. The power of unity. In Genesis chapter 11, it's a fascinating story. In fact, we read it last year in our Missio Day series. It's the story of the construction and building of the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, one says this. Now the whole world had one language. There's that word again. One language. And a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see their city and the tower that the people were building and the Lord said, if as, here's this word again, one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, look at this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. What's the principle here? Well, the principle is this, unity multiplies power. I want to say this to you again, unity multiplies power. Unity works on the multiplication principle. You remember maybe whenever you learned addition in school, I got little girls. In fact, I got my youngest is going into the second grade this year. Hard to believe that my youngest is going into the second grade. But right now in first grade, she's learning a little bit of addition. You know addition, one plus one is two, two plus two is four, three plus three is six. But somewhere around third, fourth grade, maybe even a little earlier, you start to learn about multiplication. And you already know this. Multiplication works differently than addition, where with addition, three plus three equals six. Three times three equals what, class? Nine. Very good. Very good. You passed. You are smarter than a second grader. So three times three equals nine. And what is that? That's because it's multiplying itself. It doesn't work like addition. Three and three don't make six whenever there's multiplication. In fact, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's the multiplication effect, and that's exactly how unity works. That's what we see here in this strange story of Genesis 11. What do we see? We see these people collecting together, and as one people, they set their minds and hearts to do a thing, and God says if they've set their heart as one people to do this, nothing that they set their hearts to will be impossible for them. Now, in this case, they're doing something that God doesn't want them to do. 
But the principle still holds true. Unity multiplies power. When I was a senior in high school, the little Christian school that I went to, we happened to have an amazing basketball team. We went 32 and two my senior year. And it was so fun being a part of that team. I mean, we were just routing the teams that we played. I mean, often it wasn't uncommon for us to score 30 points in the first quarter. Other team might have eight. We're just destroying teams. We scored over 100 points a game. In fact, we averaged more than 100 points a game every game. And if you know anything about high school basketball with only eight minute quarters, that's a lot of points. But we were that good. We had just a great team. And at the end of the year, uh, we went to this tournament in somewhere in Tennessee. I don't exactly even remember where it was. It was in the hills of Tennessee. We went to a, a Christian school tournament. There were the best Christian schools from all over the place had driven into Tennessee to play in this tournament together. And I remember showing up there, playing in this tournament, watching these other teams coming from, some came from as far away as the Bahamas to play in this tournament. Well, we won our first game, we won our second game, we made it to the championship game in the third round, and we were playing a school that athletically was superior to us. In fact, we were solid athletically, but not amazing. We didn't have one Division I athlete on our team. There was maybe one guy who probably maybe could have played Division I basketball, but he didn't. We had several guys that went and played small school basketball, but no Division I athletes. What made us so good was the synergy that we had together as a team. We had a great coach who knew how to get his players to play together. And so we were stronger than we ever would have been individually because he knew how to get us to play in unity. And you, if you follow sports at all, you understand this about team dynamics, is it's not always the teams with the best players who win the game, but it's often the teams that know how to play best together. And that's the power of the dynamic of unity, is that when you're unified and when people are aimed at one objective, everyone's aligned together, it's amazing what can be accomplished and the same principle, by the way, holds true not just for a sports team, but it works in your marriage. It works in your business. It works on a team that you work or serve with. Wherever there's unity, people go further, faster. We accomplish more. Occasionally, and you've had, we've all had this experience, I'm moving a, a piece of furniture into the house that I cannot carry on my own, so I'll grab Heather one of the kids, and maybe two or three of us will grab a piece of furniture. We've all had this experience. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You get on one end, they get on the other. But what would happen if while everybody's holding on to their part of the furniture, everybody decided to pull in the direction that they were facing? How productive would we be? We might move, but we would move only a little bit in the direction of the strongest person which is interesting because that's how a lot of teams and marriages work as well. They're not moving quickly, they're just moving slowly in the direction of the strongest person on the team. And when I say strong, I don't mean the best, I just mean the most forceful. Maybe you've been a part of a team like this where there wasn't unity, there wasn't a synergy, and so we moved or we accomplished things very, very slowly and only in the direction of the most forceful or powerful person on the team. See, that's how a lot of our relationships work. But when we have unity, it's amazing how far we can go. That's why Jesus would pray and ask God for unity, because he knows that the church will go further faster when we're aligned. Look at Acts chapter 2. At the beginning of the church, in fact, the very, the, the, like the genesis of the church, look at how closely aligned the early church was. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. Think about that for a second. How up for that are you? Tell you what, church, let's just all throw all of our possessions and everything into a pot and just say, hey, whatever you need, whatever is mine is yours. How many of us are like, I'm good with that kind of a church? But that's exactly what they had in the first century. So look, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
And they didn't meet together just weekly, they met together every day in the temple courts. Is it any wonder then that the power of God flowed mightily through a church like this? Why? Because they were in unity together. So there is power in unity. Now, here's an interesting thought though. The reverse is also true. Where unity lifts, where unity builds up, where unity propels, division destroys. Division tears down. Division stalls. If you've ever been in a relationship that was breaking down, maybe in a marriage that was breaking down or breaking apart, you know the feeling of what that feels like. It doesn't feel like you're making a lot of progress. It doesn't feel like we're gaining ground. It feels like everything has come to a halt. Everything kind of shuts down. Why? Because that's the nature of division. Now let me just pause and say this. Not all division is wrong. And this may help some of you. There is a time when it's appropriate to divide. There's a time when it's appropriate to separate. There's a time when in a relationship we say, you know what, it's best if we had our separate ways. But that should only happen after much prayer and counsel and thought. And we should be patient to do such things and to make such decisions. And especially when we're making decisions like this about relationships that have been mutually beneficial for a long time. We should be very careful when and how we decide and determine to divide. And what I'm seeing right now is that we're quick to divide when we should be slow. And I think that if we would press into the value and the power of unity, we would see that we could get further, faster, if we would align together, pulling in the same direction as one people. Now here's the second thought about unity. I wanna talk about the diversity of unity. The diversity of unity. Has it ever occurred to you that there must be diversity in order for there to be unity? Stop and think about that for a second. If there is no diversity, then there's no need for unity because everyone is already the same. So unity is not, and this is a key thought, because a lot of times when we talk about unity, I think what we mean is that everybody ought to have the same opinion. Everybody ought to have the same political beliefs. Everybody ought to have the same personality or do things the, the same way. But here's a key principle. And remember this, if you're taking notes, write this down. Unity is not sameness. I want to say this again. Unity is not sameness. To achieve unity or to see unity happen, it doesn't mean that you have to check your opinions at the door. It doesn't mean you have to check your brain at the door. It doesn't mean you have to check your deeply held beliefs and experiences and personality type at the door. Unity, rather than us letting go of our diversity, means bringing our diversity to the table because what we recognize is this, that our diversity makes us stronger. That it's through the differences that we have that we actually gain strength and we are benefited and strengthened as a result. And this is a, an amazing thing to think about. The place I see this happen the most in my life is in the closest relationship that I have, and that's with my wife, Heather. We've been married 21 years this August, and uh, Heather and I are very different in so many different ways. In fact, I remember, I don't remember when, being at a, a, a lunch or something that we were at together one time, and we were sitting there talking, and it kind of dawned on me, I never really said it out loud, I guess I probably already knew it, but you ever have one of those moments where you just say something out loud that you re has always been true, but you kind of verbalize it, and it just sort of hit home for you more significantly? I realized, we have almost nothing in common. Like, we're way different. I'm an introvert, like a major introvert. She's a major extrovert. She likes to read. I like to watch movies. Uh, I like my music loud. She likes her music very quiet. You know, we're, we're just, we're very different. We don't share uh, the same hobbies. I like to ride motorcycles. Heather has no interest in motorcycles whatsoever. She is not into that. She doesn't like loud noises or wind in her face. So motorcycles don't work for her. 
So we're really different. In fact, I was thinking about this just the other day, um, how different we are just in terms of like love languages. I don't know if you're familiar with the whole idea of love languages, but love languages basically talks about how you give and receive love. And for me, when I think about how I give and receive love, it's easy. Write me a note, say something nice to me. In fact, on Father's Day, Heather will write me the nicest note. And it means so much to me. The kids will write me a note. I can barely get through it without, you know, tears. That's just how I am. Or if you get me a a little gift, it means so much to me. None of that works for Heather. The way Heather receives love, chores. She wants work done. If I want to say I love you to Heather, apparently, and a lot of women in the room, uh, yeah, okay, the way to make that happen is change these air filters, change out all the the, the lights that are burnt out, hang some pictures, please, let's get this project done. If ever I'm feeling, let's just say frisky, and Heather (laughs) is not, all I have to do is say, hey, you want to go run some errands together? <laughs> and it's on. That's like, that's like putting on Barry White or Marvin Gaye, man. I mean, that is it in my house. That does it. <laughs> some of y'all are going, okay, Wit has, you're doing the math. Wit has five kids. Wit must really love doing chores. No. <laughs> I just really love my wife. <laughs> So we're really, really different. One of, one of the other ways that I think we're so different is that um, Heather loves trying new things. I do not love trying new things. I like doing the same thing that I did yesterday or eating at the same place that I'm familiar with. Trying something new on the menu, not for me. I want to order the old faithful, the standby. And here's why. I don't know. If, can you relate to this? you ever feel like if I try something, what if it's not as good as the thing I love? And then I'm disappointed and I'm wishing that I had gotten the thing that I love so much. So let's just stick with what's there. I don't even need a menu. I like what I like. Heather likes to try new things. This makes marriage difficult sometimes. Because over the years, Heather's wanted to go do stuff. Can we go over here and try this? I'm like, no, I don't want to try that. Can we go in there? I don't want to go in there. My introvert gets all weird, and I don't want to walk into some place that I don't know and I'm not familiar with. And I, I have, and I feel bad about this, but for years, so many things, Heather bent to my preferences because I was unwilling to do things her way. And it took me years to learn this. Husbands, listen to me. It took me years to learn that God didn't put her near me so that I could make her more like me. I was meant to learn something from her. And when I got it into my thick skull that if I would open up a little bit and just let her take the lead, that life was gonna get a whole lot better for me. And that's not just about maintaining peace, I actually really like a lot of the suggestions that Heather has. I would never have found some of these things. In fact, there's whole new areas of the world and food and things that I never would have tried unless she was saying, come on, let's give it a try. Let's go do this. And I'm so thankful for that. But God put her next to me, not so that I could make her more like me. And how often do we do that? Why aren't you more like me? Why don't you think about it like I think about it? Because obviously my way of thinking is correct. Anybody ever been there? My way, my point of view is the right point of view. Why can't you get with the program? Why don't you clean house like I clean house when I would like for you to clean, like all of that. All of those are things that, you know, Heather and I have, we got different ways of doing stuff and it gets, it gets tense. And when I've learned to just go, let me lean into who you are, I have gained so much and become a better man. In fact, I can say this, and I I hope she's watching right now. You ought to be watching. If she's... (laughs) She knows this already, but I'll look into the camera and tell her, Heather, there is nobody, nobody but nobody who has introduced me to Jesus more and brought me closer to Jesus more than you. And that's why I'm so thankful for you. It's true. But see, there's, there's unity in diversity. 
It's not about trying to get her to be like me. It's about learning that she has something to offer. A lot of people right now are going, so what do I do right now in this cultural moment? How do I respond? I'm not asking you to let go of your opinions. I'm just asking you to listen to other people. You know what, I love what Blake Zimmerman preached a couple weeks ago. Did you hear the sermon on listening? It was an amazing sermon. And here's what he said, is that loving feels like being heard. Like when I'm heard, I, I, I feel like somebody has loved me well. And so often we, we're not showing up to listen, we're waiting for our turn to speak. So I'm not saying let go of your opinion, I'm saying come with your opinion and your perspective and your experience, but come with humility. Well, why humility? Well, here's why. Because humility comes at it from this perspective. Humility says, I have an opinion. I have some deeply held beliefs. I'm not, I don't think I'm moving off of this space that I've been standing on, I'm not giving this up. But I do recognize that other people have different experiences and a different way of seeing things. I, I want to I hear from you. Talk to me. And humility is able to listen. Right now we have so many people who don't want to listen, we want to teach. We'd be a lot better off if we would learn to listen right now. I think there would be a lot more peace in our world. So listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. He says this, there is one body, oh there's that word again, but it has many parts. But all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We are all baptized by one Holy Spirit. Are you picking up on a theme here? And so we are formed into one body. And it didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We are all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of just one part. It has many parts, meaning that we come to this body of Christ, this collective that we are with differing perspectives and opinions and points of view, and humility says, I need to learn to appreciate the other perspectives and points of view because I'm not, I am not so prideful to think that my point of view is the right point of view. I just recognize that my point of view is mine. And so Paul says, there's a lot of different ways of seeing this. There's a, a, a body and it's diverse and it's beautiful in its diversity. He continues by saying this, I want you to think about how all this makes you, and I love this verse, more significant church family, not less. In other words, our diversity makes us beautiful and strong together, that's why we have it. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge, it's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. There's beauty and strength in our diversity when we learn to lean into it. Rather than push back against it, we learn to lean into it. So you don't have to give up your perspective. You don't have to give up your, your beliefs. You don't have to give up your experience or any of that. It just means that when we, unity in diversity is all of us bringing our perspectives and opinions to the party and saying, oh wow, I wanna hear from you. Oh wow, how do you see it? That's why small groups are so huge. That's why I'm always encouraging people to get in a small group because it's, in a small group that often we get to see how God is working in a someone's story that is very different from my own. And it gives me an appreciation for all the different and beautiful ways that God works in his body. Can I get an amen, church family? That's a good thought. So, unity and diversity. All right, now let me bring you to our third thought. Final point is this. I wanna talk about the gift of unity, the gift of unity. We're living in a culture right now, and this is fascinating, but we're living in a culture that has a belief in the capacity of, of human beings. And what I mean by that is that if we could just educate ourselves, right, if we could just pull people out of poverty, if we could just sit down and have a listening session and everybody could hear from each other, that then we could achieve unity together. 
In other words, the way our culture thinks about the division problem is we see it as a social issue, something that can be solved with enough hard work and understanding and empathy. But if you're a follower of Christ, you cannot and must not subscribe to that point of view. And let me tell you why. Because as a follower of Christ, we recognize that all sin, I want to say this again, all sin stems from a broken relationship with us and God. And we are unable to repair that broken relationship. Meaning that the sin problem is greater than anything we can solve on our own. So we dare not think that if we just have enough education, that if we could just have enough social programs and enough ministries or charities or whatever, counseling, whatever could happen out there in the world, that we could get people, all of us could get to a place of understanding and there could be peace on earth. You drive around and you see those bumper stickers that say coexist. I see those all over the place. And I I, I think about those because I think the, the idea behind those bumper stickers is that exact idea that if we could all get together and get in the same room and talk with one another, that we could all somehow get along. And I'm here to tell you, it won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is because our problem is not social, our problem is spiritual. And it's a problem greater than we can solve on our own. So we need a savior who comes from outside of ourselves to do something about the real problem. That's why I call this section of the sermon the gift of unity, because unity is a gift of grace. Look at this. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, we're going to look at it. This is Paul writing, and he's writing about the ultimate division. And he says this, therefore remember, and I want you to just take this word to heart. Remember, Church on the Move, remember. Remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember, there's that word again, that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Without hope, this is harsh, but I want you to take this in. Really read this and think about this. Without hope and without God in the world. What is Paul saying? He's saying that, look, the deepest division that mankind has ever known is that of a spiritual division. When Paul talks about the circumcision and the Gentiles, what he's talking about is the covenant that God made with his people, Israel. And the covenant that God made with his people was not based on race. It was based on a covenant, an agreement that he had made with a man named Abraham, that he had reaffirmed down through the generations with Abraham and with David. And God had reaffirmed and reestablished again and again this covenant. And the people of Israel were the ones who were in covenant. And Paul was saying, everybody else who he's referring to as Gentiles, which by the way, would be most of us in this room and probably most of us watching online, everybody else was excluded from this covenant. And Paul says, at that time, when you were excluded, when you were far from Christ, you were without hope and without God in the world. And what Paul is saying here is significant. There's a lot that divides us. There's a lot going on in our country right now that divides us, but the deepest division that we have ever known, that mankind has ever known and will ever know, is spiritual division. And so when Paul is talking about this, he's talking about a chasm that we could not cross. No amount of education, no amount of funding, no amount of social programs could deal with this division. Only God could do that. That's why this next verse but now in Christ, sorry, back that up, I I threw you off there, there we go, but now in Christ, Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, I wanna just pause, and I wanna read this again, because if you really understood, if this was true up here and you really believed it, if you really felt like I once was without hope and without God in the world, 
then when I read this next verse again, it ought to make you celebrate big time because you recognize the reality of what is actually going on here. So I'm gonna read it again and see if you get it. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's good news. That's the best news. And by the way, that so many of us are golf clapping for that, I, I recognize that we don't quite get it. But it is the greatest news. You were without hope and without God in the world, but Jesus came and he bridged the gap that you could not bridge. And so wherever you find yourself, maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here in this room or in this auditorium and, and, and you're in a dark place right now. Maybe COVID for you has been a really difficult season for you and you are not close to God. Can I tell you, that's okay. Jesus has come near to you. That's the good news of the gospel. He is near. And so look at what Paul says. He continues, he says this. For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace. He's the bond that unites us, who has made the two groups, Gentiles and Jews, or the circumcision, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself, look at this, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Now what is Paul saying here? He's saying, Christians, church, Christ followers, the deepest bond that we have, the deepest bond a human being can have is the bond that we share in Christ. Now I want you to think about this for a second. The deepest identity, the most foundational way that you think about yourself ought to be thinking about yourself in Christ. There are a few different ways that Christians are described in the New Testament. Did you know that the, the, the term Christian only appears in the New Testament just a couple of times. It's barely in there at all. Christian is almost never used. And that one or two times that it is used, it's used in a more of a derogatory fashion. Fascinating. Other people called Christians Christians. It was kind of a look down their nose at Christians in the first century. There's a, another word that's used, disciples. It's used far more than the word Christian, but more than any of that, the word that's used or the two words that are used to describe followers of Jesus more than anything else in the New Testament are these two words, in Christ. In Christ. What does this mean? It means that your deepest identity, the most foundational truth about you, is that you are in Christ. Before you're an American, before you're a Republican or a Democrat, before you're a man or a woman, before you're a business owner or an employee, before you're a graphic designer or a fireman, before you are a father or a mother, you are in Christ. Now, I want you to think about this because all of us carry around all sorts of different categories that we belong to. There are demographic groups that you are a part of. And if we were to go around and talk to each other, we could find out what groups each of us are in. And we come from really diverse and different backgrounds and we hold different beliefs and different experiences. But the unifying thing above all of that is that we are in Christ. Now I want you to stop and think about that because here's what this means. And this is a huge concept. And this right here alone, if you get this, could change everything is that when you truly recognize you are in Christ, it means that every other identity group you belong to must eventually at some point bow its knee to the fact that you are first in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Stop and think about that for a second. That means at some point, at some point my identity as American 
as an American is going to have to bow its knee to Jesus. At some point, my political identity is going to have to bow its knee to Jesus. At some point, my, my family identity is going to have to bow its knee to Jesus. I don't get to do things like I want to do them. I bring my thoughts, my perspective to Jesus, and I look at how he does things in his kingdom, and if there's a difference, guess who wins? Jesus does. So I don't get to show up with my opinion and say, well, this is my opinion. I show up and I say, what does is, what is love require of me? What is Jesus, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus respond? And I, I let my other identities bow their knee to Jesus. And when we do that, guess what? We end up with a, a church full of people who are on their knees together, in unity together, because we are first in Christ. Now, I want you to look, and I'm going to wrap this up here. In fact, I'm going to invite Jesse to come out, and we'll get the keyboard going, and I'll get you out of here. I'm going a little bit long. But unity is a gift. We could not achieve it for ourselves. No social programs could do it. It had to be given to us by Christ, and therefore, that means it's a gift of grace. It means you don't earn it, and I don't earn it either. But this is a huge principle about following Jesus. All the time you hear people say, oh, that's, that's works. I don't want to get off into the flesh or into works. I'm a grace person. I, too, am a grace person. But I want you to notice what Paul says two chapters later in Ephesians 4. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What if we could all live this next sentence out? Be completely humble and gentle. Be completely humble and gentle in your workplace. Be completely humble and gentle with your spouse. Be completely humble and gentle with your parents. Be completely humble and gentle on Facebook. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then look at this, make every, what's this word right here? Effort. Effort. A lot of Christian people think that's a dirty word in the New Testament. Shouldn't be there, Paul. Shouldn't have used it. We don't have effort. I have everything as a gift of grace. Well, this is the tension. God does give gifts of grace, but he expects you to keep those gifts of grace with your effort. Look what he says. Make every effort to keep. You didn't you didn't gain unity of the Spirit. That was given to you as a gift by Jesus Christ. But you certainly can keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And that comes through your effort. What does this mean? Last thought is this. Grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. We don't earn any of the gifts that God gives us, but we have an effort to uphold them and to keep them. And that means that, friends, if there's going to be unity, it will come at the expense of your effort to keep it. And so my charge to all of you here in this room and those joining online is that over the next few weeks, we work to get better at keeping the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, unity in our homes, unity on social media, in the business, in the community, wherever we find ourselves, that we're completely gentle, humble, bearing with one another in love. And when we do this, when we are one on our knees before Christ, here's what happens. As Jesus said in John 17, he said, then the world, they'll see that I was sent by the Father. They'll see me in you because you're imaging me. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe you're here in the room, maybe you're watching online and you are not in Christ today. Or maybe not in Christ in the way that you know you need to be in Christ. Maybe this season's been really hard for you and you've really drifted away from God and you wanna come home today. If that's you, whether you're in this room or watching online, wherever you are, would you just do me the favor of being bold enough and lifting your hand and saying, Whit, that's me. I want you to pray for me. Whit, would you just pray for me? Yes, over here to my left, I see you. Over here more to my left, I see you. Thank you for being bold enough. Over here to my right, yep, more over here, over here, over here. You might be watching online right now. Would you just let somebody know in the chat that you would want my prayer? 
I'm just gonna ask you to take that bold step. I'm gonna pray for you here in just a second. Thank you for being so bold. I'm gonna pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed, let's pray this. I'll pray this, you don't even have to repeat after me, I'll just pray it over you. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who have been bold enough to raise their hands today, to take that step. And even for those, Lord, who weren't able to do that, but they know they need to draw closer to you, I pray for them. First of all, Lord, I pray that as they take this step near to you, that they would have a sense of your nearness to them, that they would know that you are not here to judge them or to condemn them, but that you wait for them with open arms. You welcome them into your family. And so, Lord, I I pray today that you would give them the courage to take a next step and a next, to follow you into deeper relationship like never before. And Lord, help us as fellow followers of Christ and journeyers with them to take their hand and walk with them step by step, gently and patiently to lead them to Jesus. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's the attitude that we want here. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for what's happening in so many today. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about what uh, Pastor Witt was talking about when he talked about the power of unity. And he talked about how unity, it multiplied power and how unity, it opened up doors. And in unity, uh, it, it was something uh, synergistic about it that, that got us moving in the right, good direction. And, and then on the other side, he, he said, okay, now division does just the opposite. It closes doors, it stops things, it hinders us. And for me, I'm, I'm sure you're like this too. There's been so much of my life when I was divided from God and it stopped things and it closed doors and I had no idea. I, I did not know how good God was. I, if, if I would have stayed divided, I would have missed out on great relationships. Uh, brothers and sisters that I have in Christ now, people that I depend on and lean on. Look, right now, something in the message, I'm, I'm sure it did, it touched you, it kind of stirred something in you and you feel like I need to respond. I don't know what to do, but I know I need to do something. But we're gonna give you a step. If you text the word next, that's next, to 23101, what we're gonna do, we're gonna contact you. Somebody's gonna call you, they wanna hear your story, and we're going to help you walk this thing out. Whatever it is, we'll help you figure out what your next step looks like. So text the word next, to 23101 and hey we're going to get with you at at, uh, at this church we believe we don't we don't live life alone we don't do these things alone we walk it out together yeah amen so so do that and we have our, our lead pastor with george hey. hey wonderful message i love Thank it you. uh why this message for this season oh man well you know let's like i said i mean there's so much tension right now i don't know if you feel it but i do oh yeah it's like man i mean people are on edge and and I was talking to a friend the other day. He's, you know, does client work. And he was just talking about, man, my clients are on edge and people. And it's, I mean, it's nothing but just business that they're doing. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, anything like touching on social issues. It's just business. But people are just on edge. And I'm seeing it creep into the church. And uh, I can't, you know, I can't change everybody out in culture. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel like it's my job to steer the church a little bit and shepherd our people and say, hey, this is where we're going to go. And so I feel like this is just where God's leading us right now is we need this. And I think if ever there was a time to talk about unity, this is it. So absolutely, that's kind of why. One of the things you touched on, uh, um, so you talked about division and this is tough for me. I, I know this is probably tough for some of you out there. Uh, social media, yeah. it was like a couple weeks ago, somebody was on Facebook and it was something simple and silly. Uh, they said that people don't like pepperoni and pineapple pizza because the internet tells them not to but not be but it's really great and i I was offended i was like no that's not why so i felt like i had to create an argument for this yeah like there's so many things that try to put us on one side of the the other how do we navigate through that you know i I, yeah i think i think it's 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 through listening it's it's showing up going hey my perspective is not the only perspective and coming in with humility and saying hey i want i want to listen and you know and I, I touched on this just a little bit but listening is more than just waiting for your turn to speak listening is really trying to hear 
with the other person and understand where they're coming from. I, I listened to a podcast with you on it this week, which was uh, the Art of Understanding podcast. You were on there with Jesse. Yeah, it was and fun. It was such a great interview. It, it, all the, it's called the listening sessions that he was doing, but the podcast is Art of Understanding if you want to hear it. And he was just asking you about, you know, what what was life like uh, for you growing up? And what's been your experience from your perspective as a black man growing up in the United States? What is that like? And it's a different perspective and a different story than I had. And it was it was really interesting just to sit and hear. And I think so often we, we just show up with opinions already formed, mm -hmm. narratives already kind of, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, but we, we show up already kind of knowing what's what. And I think humility says, no, I, I, I have my beliefs, that's okay, but I'm showing up, I wanna hear, hear from you. And especially those who are, you know, as scripture says, in the household of faith, meaning, you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I really wanna give them the benefit of the doubt and sit and hear and go, hmm, let, you know, let me hear from your perspective. And it may not change my mind or uh, my beliefs, but I think, I think here's what I've learned is that I always grow in empathy when I listen. That's good. And so I think that would help so much right now. Yeah. And, and from my side, it was something so healing. Yes. To feel <laughs> understood, to feel yes. listened to, like someone was concerned. Wow. So I, I love that. Now, touching touching on that, kind of piggybacking on yeah. that, you talked about the the power of difference and diversity. Mm -hmm. Why is why is that important? Well, but because I think there's so much that we miss when we're just around people like us, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's, there's so much to be, there's a, there's a richer, fuller life out there. And I'm, I'm one of those people, I'll hold my hand up and say, I'm one of those people that would have said, yeah, I'm good with my life as it is. You know, I don't even need to look at the menu. I like, I like what I get every time, right? I'm, I'm one of those folks, but I have learned and Heather's really helped to teach me this, that there's so much more out there and that I am, I am enriched and changed and maybe bettered as a result of hearing other perspectives and learning how to communicate in a new way and learning that not everybody communicates in the same way that I do and not everybody likes to be communicated in the same way that I like to communicate. I like a direct approach. You know, I think about Pastor Lee, he wants to, he, he's going to massage his way in there, kind of, that's how he is. It's okay. Yes. It's just different. And I've learned, my wife's like that. And I've had to learn how to go, um, if I just like, if I show up with the hammer every time, I end up breaking stuff. I need, I need a little bit of finesse. And honestly, it's made me a better leader better father. I understand my kids better because of the way I've had to relate to my wife. And that, that's all because of diversity. She's different. And I find that the more diversity I'm around, uh, the more I grow and am changed and challenged. So it's, I think it's nothing but good stuff from it. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've had to learn. I'm sure some of you all out there, especially marriage and relationships is something about we have to kind of adjust yeah. For, for me, oh, yeah. my family, we, especially on my father's side, we argue and mm. it's fun. Yeah, we yeah, debate like it. and it's yeah, fun. We do too. My wife, it is not fun. <laughs> yeah. And she would be like, I'm, I'm not arguing anymore. I'm like, hey, we're, we're having fun. What are you doing? Yeah, so that that's uh, that's something that <laughs> so I had to good. change yes. and learn. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so um, what's your, your final prayer? Yeah. Like what's your, your simple prayer for the Capital C yes. Church right now in this season? I, it's exactly how I ended it. My prayer is that our greatest bond our mm -hmm. deepest and strongest bond would be the bond of, of being in Christ together. Yes. And that if we could remember that, I think we would have more patience with each other. I think we would be more humble when we approach each other. I think there would be a different spirit in the way that we approach each other. If we could just remind ourselves that we are first and foremost above all else in Christ. And if you're a follower of Christ, that's exactly your story. That's your reality. And that's the, that's the, that's the family above all other families. The identity above all other identities is that one right there. We're in Christ together. Hey Amen. That's really cool. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank oh. you for hanging out with us. Super hey, fun. Throw some hearts, throw some likes. How do you like having Pastor Witt just come and, you know, be, uh, have a conversation and, and hang out with us? I think that's really cool. So now it is time for Kids on the Move. Yep. I know parents, your kids are probably in the background. Kids on the move, kids yes. on the move. So get ready. We're going to dance. We're going to have fun. We're going to learn about Jesus. Uh, shooting to Kids on the Move. <laughs>